Well, as Bruce said, we do have a lot of our Chapel Street students, kids in the service today, and you may hopefully have noticed that as you walked in, uh, our children's staff has created a special Chapel Street Kids Worship Notes page like this. So in the next few weeks, if you uh, didn't get one today, you can pick one of these up. It's a way to follow along with the message today if you're a young person. Uh, lots of fun stuff on here, and if you fill it out, you can take it out to the kiosk and get a special prize after the service. How's that for motivation to pay attention? If you're an adult, you may want to pick one of these up too because it might help you pay attention. <laughs> we need one of these for adults, I think. Uh, I don't think you're going to get a prize though, so pick one up. Well, a number of years ago, I was on my way to church one morning, I think middle of the week, and I decided to run a couple of errands. I needed to deposit a check at the bank and then stop by the hardware store, maybe to get some lawn bags or something. So I pulled into my ATM at the bank and deposited the check and then decided at the last minute while I was still in my car to get, get a little bit of cash. Now, you need to know that I don't uh, like to carry much cash in my pockets. I really don't know why that is. I, I just don't. My brother teases me about it all the time. But I say that to explain that's why I asked the ATM for $10. Now, it tells you how long ago it was because there's no longer an option just for $10 on most ATMs. It's only $20. But I was trying to get $10 out of my ATM, so I punched in $10, and when the bill and the receipt came, I just took them without looking and tucked them into my shirt pocket and headed to the hardware store. I uh, found the lawn bags, and when I went to the checkout line to pay, I was going to use the cash in my pocket. And when I took out the cash, I took out not a 10, but a 20. And I knew it had to be what I put in my pocket because I had no other cash on me. And I looked at it, I was kind of confused, so then I took out the receipt real quick, standing in line, and glanced at it, and sure enough, it said, $20. I'd asked for 10 and it gave me 20. So I put the money back in my pocket. I paid with my, uh, my de debit card and I walked back to my car kind of confused. I double checked, every, double checked everything. And uh, then just to be sure, I drove back to my bank. Went to the same ATM, punched in $10 and it happened again. I got a $20 bill out of the ATM. Uh, now my first thought was, God is so good to me. <laughs> No, not really. Uh, but I did have a decision to make and all kinds of things. And just those few moments were going through my head. Like I remember the last time my bank charged me 20 bucks for a tiny little overdrawn thing. I remember all the times they charged me two extra dollars for getting cash out of a different ATM. I was just thinking about all that stuff. Uh, and it wasn't my fault that it was being overly generous, you know. But then this little voice said, maybe you should go into the bank and tell them their machine is having a problem. Oh, and by the way, take those two 20s with you. So that's what I did. Now we all deal with money every day. And we all know that money or wealth plays an enormous role in our culture and in our lives. We also know that money has a certain power to it, a kind of a gravitational attraction, that it, it bends everything that gets close to it and it can pull our hearts and our minds, even our lives, all out of shape. Even $20 has that power. And that's what James is going to talk to us about today. We're in a summer-long series from the book of James called Street Level Faith. And through the first four chapters now, James has been addressing a whole list of issues uh, that the early church, these early Jewish background Christians were dealing with. Uh, and he's been rather blunt about some of these issues. And now as we begin chapter 5, we're going to see he uses the very strongest language yet in talking to his target audience. James 5, I'm going to begin in verse 1. You can follow along on the screens as I read. James writes, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Now I need to pause there for a second because the question we have right here, if we've been paying attention through this series, is who is James talking to? Come now, weep and howl for the miseries coming upon you. Up to this point, he's been addressing these young Jewish background Christians who are facing all kinds of persecution, who've been scattered around the region of Jerusalem, uh, who are fleeing persecution, and are dealing with all sorts of issues, trying to put their faith into practice. But who is he talking to now? Most scholars believe that James right here shifts his audience, that he's no longer writing to Christians, he's writing to those outside the faith, possibly to those about those who are doing the persecuting. It seems here that James is taking the role of an Old Testament prophet that is warning of God's coming judgment on sin, 
warning about God is going to judge all those who are godless and evil as a way of encouraging God's people. In fact, the language he uses here, weep and howl, comes straight out of the Old Testament prophets. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 13 says, wail for the day of the Lord is near, meaning judgment is coming. But even though he's aiming these comments at the non-believing world, I think there are things that we as followers of Christ can listen to and learn from about what he has to say about our wealth. So continuing verse 2. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Okay, pretty serious stuff. James begins chapter 5 with, first of all, warnings about wealth. Some warnings about wealth. A bunch of years ago, my brother Joe called me on the phone. He was all excited about this new investment opportunity. Now, we were both young guys in our first ministry jobs, fathers of young children, and neither one of us had even college funds or retirement accounts at that time, let alone spare cash to throw into some sort of investment. But he was all excited. Some friend had told him about this chance to invest in Christian music concerts, and was promising a really high rate of return. And this is how it worked. Uh, if you invested, you know, say $1,000, that money was used to underwrite an upcoming concert uh, through promotions. And then, based on ticket sales, you'd receive a return of 20, 30, even 50%, and you'd get that in 30 days. That was the deal. And that sounded pretty good. So we scraped together a little bit of money and invested in the next concert. Sure enough, within 30 days, we got a 40% return on that investment. So we did it again. Rolled that money, found some more money, put another investment in, sure enough, 40% in 30 days. Then we got excited. We started talking about, oh, how long till we can invest real money? I mean, how many concerts till we're like, you know, millionaires? Now, to make about a two-year story much shorter, we eventually made our largest investment to date, a series of five concerts all in one chunk, all the money we could gather. Four of those investments came back, like always, but the last one never came back. 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and then my brother called me to say he had received a call from the FBI that said the concert promoter we were giving our money to had stolen all the money from all the investors all over the country, $15 million worth, and was gone. Fugitive of justice. We never got that money back. Now, fortunately, we broke even, all told, but we learned a very valuable lesson. That is, when it comes to money, if it seems too good to be true, right, it probably is. James says, chapter 5, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. There are actually four warnings in these three short verses. First, a warning that wealth provides false security. Wealth provides false security. Historians tell us that in the culture and time in which James was writing, there were three main indicators of wealth. This is first century, first century Middle Eastern life. First was food. That is, the ancient economy was built on agriculture, so grain was a measure of wealth. Those who owned farms or vineyards were among the wealthy. Secondly, clothing. At a time when most people had only one change of clothing, to have multiple changes of clothing made you a wealthy person. And third was gold and silver, what we would simply call money. Now notice James says, your riches have rotted. There he's referring to stored up grain or excess food that eventually rots over time. Then he says, your garments are moth-eaten. He's referring to their clothing, which over time will disintegrate. And then he says, your gold and silver have corroded. What he's saying is, everything you depend on for security will eventually fail you. Did you see the story this past week about Facebook and CEO Mark Zuckerberg? 
Okay, leave that image on while I talk about this. After reporting less than expected earnings and a loss of confidence over security issues, Facebook dropped, stock dropped 19% in one day. The single largest stock loss of value in American history in one day. Mark Zuckerberg's personal net worth lost $15 billion in one day. That's why the sad face, okay? Disappeared, gone. That's what James is talking about. Wealth offers false security, he says. Now, a little detour here. The Bible does not teach that money is evil. It does not. The Bible teaches that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The Bible does not teach that possession of great wealth is a sin. There are plenty of very, very wealthy people in God's word who are very godly people who use their great wealth to honor God. Some of the most generous people in the world today are people of enormous wealth. Did you see the story this week about basketball star LeBron James? Now, it's easy to look at someone like LeBron James and think spoiled, entitled, millionaire, athlete, and many think of people like him in just those ways. But last week, LeBron James launched a new school through his family foundation called the I Promise School. The purpose of the school is to provide at-risk kids in Akron, Ohio, a chance not just at education, but for a future. School is free, provides meals during the day, job counseling for parents, a food pantry. Every student gets a bicycle. And on top of all that, every student who graduates from high school with a 3.0 GPA, and there are 1,200 students eligible, is a guarantee, has a guaranteed full-ride scholarship to Akron University. If all 1,200 graduate, LeBron James is on the hook for $40 million to pay for their education. So wealth is not the problem. It's what we do with wealth and what wealth does to us. One of the things wealth does to us, James says, is offer false security. Second warning is that wealth is also seductive. Wealth is seductive. Over the past couple of weeks, um, I just noticed, I stopped by uh, a handy stop gas station maybe three or four times in the last couple of weeks. And every time I went inside, um, there was always, all four times, someone in front of me in line was buying a lottery ticket. All four times. You ever notice that? How, many, how often that's happening? All four times. So I did a little research. 44 out of 50 states in America have official lotteries. The single largest lottery ticket winner, single winner, was a 53-year-old woman in 2017 who won $758 million in Powerball. The odds of winning a lottery are, do you know what they are? One in 292 million, which means you are 400 times more likely to hit, get hit by lightning than you are to win a lottery. And yet, last year, Americans spent $70 billion on lottery tickets. That's more than $300 for every adult in all 44 states where lotteries are legal in this country. In fact, Americans spent more money on lottery tickets last year than they did on sporting events, movie tickets, books, video games, and recorded music combined. In addition, a recent study showed that those living below the poverty line spend twice as much as those living above the poverty line on lottery tickets, up to 10% of their total income. The question has to be asked, why? Why do so many play the lottery? And why do people who cannot afford to play, play the lottery? Because wealth is seductive. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said it this way, Matthew chapter 6, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. He's saying that money, wealth, is actually a rival to God himself for the affection and devotion of our hearts. Wealth is seductive. It's a warning. Third, James gives the warning that wealth promises what it cannot deliver. Promises what it cannot deliver. Some of you will recognize uh, this popular country song by an artist named Chris Jansen. I wish I could sing it. I ain't rich, but I sure want to be. Working like a dog all day ain't working for me. I wish I had a rich uncle that'd kick the bucket and that I was sitting on a pile like Warren Buffett. I know everyone says money can't buy happiness, but it could buy me a boat. A boat. That's right, a boat. <laughs> now, we all know money can't buy happiness, right? But deep down, deep down, most of us believe that just a little more money 
could buy a little more happiness. Some, ancient, uh, some uh, recent research suggests that income is related to satisfaction, to life satisfaction, up to a point. And then the same research shows that once you reach a certain point, once you reach a certain point of income, the relationship turns around and it goes in the inverse direction. The arrow starts to point down. Wealth promises what it cannot deliver. Finally, the warning that wealth can be destructive to our souls. James says, your gold and silver have been have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Now this is a refer referral to the final judgment of God uh, that the end result of loving and serving wealth is condemnation. Paul says it this way in 1 Timothy chapter 6, those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And that leads us to the second thing James wants us, James wants us to see, and that is the danger of wealth. He warns us and he talks about the very real dangers of wealth. How many remember uh, a, a Filipino leader named Ferdinand Marcos back years ago? Remember Marcos? Well, Marcos ruled the Philippine Islands from about 1965 to 1986, most of the time as a dictator. Uh, his rule was known for corruption, extravagance, and brutality. And after he was deposed in 1986, it was discovered that his wife, Imelda, remember her, had left behind a closet of 3,000 pairs of shoes. 3,000 pairs of shoes, which means she could wear a different pair of shoes every day and it would take her over eight years to wear the same pair twice. James here talks about four spiritual dangers or four spiritual sins. First, the sin of hoarding. He says in verse uh, three, you have laid up treasure in the last days. The phrase laid up means hoarded. The NIV translates that as hoarded. Now, when we think of hoarding, we think of people who suffer from kind of a pathological need to, to, to save up junk. This is what a hoarder's house looks like. James is not talking about that. He's not talking about saving. There's nothing wrong with saving your money and planning. Hoarding is a selfish storing up for yourself more goods and riches than you could ever need. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 in the Old Testament says, I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. Did you know that self-storage is now a $38 billion a year in the United States? There are 50,000 storage facilities in the United States today, and it's growing at $4 billion in new construction every year. Why? We as a culture have more stuff than we can store in our homes. I think if James walked through our world and noticed 50,000 self-storage facilities, he would wonder why we need to st store up so much stuff. I think he would think about the sin of hoarding. Secondly, he warns of the sin of injustice. Verse 4, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. He's talking about injustice here. A few weeks ago, my wife and I noticed that our next-door neighbors uh, had their house repainted. And we had been talking about that at our house and just didn't know where to get started. So Lorene talked to Molly, our next door neighbor, and they were really happy with the guys who did the job. So we um, hired the same guys. Two guys, two brothers, Javier and Leo, run their business. They're immigrants from Mexico. Uh, they did an incredibly good job. Eight days, took care of a whole house. All the decks did way more than we anticipated. But as we got to know them over eight days, we got to hear a bit of their story. But let's assume that when they got all done and they did they, what they said they were going to do, we decided to write them a check for half of what we had agreed to. And we did it because we could. Because they had no recourse. They don't have lawyers. They can't fight us. They had no written contract. Word of mouth. What would you think about that? That'd be wrong, right? That'd be a wrong thing to do. That would be sin. And that's what James is talking about, the rich taking advantage of the poor just because they can. And it was going on. 
Third, he talks about the sin of self-indulgence. Verse 5, you have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now, self-indulgence is pursuing pleasure and luxury to the point where it's harmful to our own souls. We all know that physical overindulgence is bad for our bodies, literally fattens our hearts. But James is saying it's far more dangerous for our spiritual lives, the sin of self-indulgence. Then he talks about, finally, the sin of murder. Verse 6, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now, this one's pretty obvious. Most of us recognize murder as a sin. James is likely referring here to those who were, who were violently persecuting uh, Christians at the time, but it's really the end result of other sins, hoarding wealth, injustice, self-indulgence, leading to the complete disregard of the value of another human being. James is suggesting in all this that there must be a better way. There must be a different way. And that's the third thing we want to talk about today, a different way. So James warns. He's warning essentially about what not to do. So he's writing about this unbelieving world around this small community of believers, and he's wanting them to listen and to learn. He's saying to us as followers of Christ, there's a different way. There's a different way to understand wealth, a far better way. I think James has in mind the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. James and Jesus want us to see three things. They're teaching us first, don't worship your wealth. James is saying, be careful. Wealth is necessary. We all need it to live, but it's superficial and it's temporary. It offers only false security. It seduces our hearts at times and ultimately can lead to destruction. It's a false gospel. Don't give it. Whatever else, don't give it your deepest de your devotion. Don't give wealth your worship. Don't give it your ultimate trust. Rather, give your heart to God who offers freely that which you cannot buy. So how do you know where your heart is, really? How do you know? Jesus said, your heart is where your treasure is. So take a good look at where your treasure is. Take a good, honest look at where your resources go, at where your money is, at where your wealth is invested. Take a good, hard look. What does it tell you about your heart? That's what Jesus is saying. Don't worship wealth. Secondly, don't hoard your wealth. I want to be careful here. Money is necessary. There's nothing wrong with earning money. There's nothing wrong with saving money. There's nothing wrong with financial planning. But when we hoard, when we allow ourselves to believe that our wealth belongs solely to us, that our wealth is for us, that it's only for us, then we are hoarding. So what's the cure for hoarding? Generosity. Generosity. Here at Chapel Street, we believe God is generous. That God is the most generous being in the entire universe. We believe the gospel itself at its heart, at its core, is generosity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And we believe that one of the marks of a transformed person, a person who's been touched by the gospel, is a growing generosity in all areas of life. James would urge us to practice regular unhoarding. I don't even think that's a word, but I just made it up. Practice regular unhoarding. And thirdly, finally, don't invest solely in your own kingdom. You know, we all have our little kingdoms. The way we live in North America, we have our little kingdoms. Don't invest solely in your own kingdom. Invest in God's eternal kingdom. We like to celebrate Stories of kingdom investment here at Chapel Street. Many of them come through um, our Serve the World initiative. 
which many of you have invested in. It's how we make the gospel visible through ministry partners all over the world and even here locally. And I asked Pastor Bruce this week, hey, give me a couple of stories just recently, a couple live stories happening right now of the way our collective generosities make an eternal difference in the world that you might not know about. So he gave me a bunch, but here's three. First, we were able as a church through Serve the World to give a gift of a thousand Bibles to pastors in Uganda. This is a room full of pastors in Uganda holding up the Bible that you, we had a chance to give them through our generosity to serve the world. Can you begin to imagine the eternal impact of a thousand Bibles in the center of Africa? I don't think we can begin to calculate what that investment return might be. Also, a few months ago, we were able to collectively to give a gift of $15,000 to purchase a vehicle for Hope for Life, a ministry in Rwanda where Chapel Streeter Amanda Good is serving, caring for street boys in a small community. Uh, this is a small little minivan, and there are at least eight boys stuffed in that van that Amanda there to the right is taking somewhere in that ministry. Can we begin to estimate the eternal v- return on an investment to these boys' lives in Africa? This coming October, over 90 Chapel Streeters will be running in the Chicago Marathon to raise money to provide clean water for villages in Africa through Team World Vision. Over 90 of us are running and or walking. How many of you are participating in that as runners or walkers? Okay. How many of you have contributed to their efforts to raise money through Facebook or whatever, contributors? So all of you are participating in making an eternal investment through water and visions of Africa. I heard uh, in communities in Africa. I also heard recently of one of our church families who recently redid their will. And in their will, they built into their estate Chapel Street Serve the World Ministries. My wife and I did that recently as well in our will. And we're getting ready to launch as a church. This is a little window. It's not public yet, but we're getting ready to launch uh, what we're calling a Chapel Street Fund for Local and Global Impact, which will function more or less like an endowment because we want to be a part of making sure that our vision for gospel impact far outlasts our generation and stretches into the next. Here's the point of all this. No one gets to the end of their earthly life and says, you know what? I wish I'd built a bigger house. No one gets to the end of their earthly life and says, you know, I wish I, wish I had 3,000 pairs of shoes. No. People get to the end of their earthly lives and what they say, what they think, what they feel is, what they pray is, I wish I'd been more generous. I wish I'd made a greater eternal impact in the time that I had. Listen to Paul as he summarizes what his brother James teaches. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Command those who are rich in this present world, that would be us, Not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, listen, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Will you bow with me as I close today? Lord God, I thank you today for your word. We thank you for the direct and sometimes cutting teaching of this ancient letter we call James. And we confess that we struggle at times with wealth. We do. We're so tempted to see it as ours. We're so tempted to hang on to it, to hoard it, to fear not having enough of it, even sometimes to love it. So teach us to honor you and worship you with our wealth. Grow in us a love for you and your kingdom that creates in us a generosity that you use to produce an eternal impact. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.